right. Um, I'd like to call the meeting to order tonight. It is June twenty second, just after seven. We'll call the meeting to order, and our first order of business is a moment of reflection before we get into approval of the agenda. So let us do start with that. So thank you for that. We will carry on with the approval of the agendas, of which we have two. We have a consent agenda. Um, is there any questions on the consent agenda? If none, a motion to approve the consent agenda is presented. Councillor Monteith makes that motion. All in favor? Any opposed? Motion carried. A regular meeting agenda. I have heard of no additions or adjustments to the agenda. So. A motion to approve the agenda as presented. Councillor Edwards makes a motion. All in favor? Any opposed? Motion carried. And for the good of council, does anyone have something they would like to share? And I would like to first start off um, just uh, acknowledging Councillor Dressler is not here tonight. Um, we wish him well. Uh, he did have a uh, a surgery last week, uh, quite a major one, and has been experiencing more uh, pain than he would like to. So uh, we want to wish him and his families the, the strength um, to carry through this time. So um, best of our knowledge, he plans to be back at his earliest convenience, but he will not be here thinking this week, but we'll, we'll see how that goes. Anyone else have some comments for the good of council? <coughs> Councillor Edwards, sorry. I just wanted to uh, thank all of the organizations that came out on Saturday afternoon for the FCSS impromptu ice cream social where we went up and down the streets and gave ice cream to everybody in town. So. Um, there was Rotary, the Lions, the Royal Purple, the firefighters all came out. We had the RCMP came. I can't remember. How, there was FCS. There were just tons of volunteers, even from people who weren't connected to those specific groups. The Boys and Girls Club came out from Lethbridge. So it took a lot of, a lot of effort, but it was super fun. And I apologize if I scared anybody coming down your street in a mask. So, but it was lots of fun, and, and um, I think that it was well received because we couldn't do our regular ice cream social at the Lions Park, so. Yeah, I heard of a friend that got an ice cream from our CMP officer and he was a little wondering what's going on here and he was questioning and said, no, I said, this is uh, ice cream. <laughs> so that was, that was cool to hear. Just a further comment on that. I had uh, relatives visiting from out of town and we were approached and received ice cream and then as we drove through town, the fire trucks playing the music, and it's like, wow, this is a happening town. This is good. <laughs> but it was really good. Uh, kudos yeah. to everybody that did that. Very good. That's, that's nice. Any other comments? Councillor Monteith. I got 9th and 10th Street on this, so it, uh, that's probably the most time I spent in that area ever. And so it was interesting to walk the streets. There's, you know, we hear a lot about that area, but there's a lot of very nice houses and areas there. So uh, if we can get uh, the problem areas solved, I think uh, I think that'll be excellent. But uh, it was it was enjoyable to walk that area because I had never done that before. <clears throat> All right, anyone else? Seeing none, we will continue on with uh, going to unfinished business on our agenda. We have one item, which is a community cats discussion. And we have a director of community policing and sports services, um, Lisa. Thank you. 
Um, as council is aware, back in March, the early part of March, we held uh, community engagement um, for the CAT program um, or the community CAT concerns. Um, there were 24 attendees at that. Um, we did surveys there as well as put the survey online after and 85 responses um, were received for that online portion as well. The results of the survey are attached here. Um, my recommendation is that council moves forward with the Alberta Animal Task Force for a trap, neuter, and return program um, and gather additional information to determine the estimated population size and financial obligation to continue with that program. Um, I think that we recognize that there's um, two separate issues in Fort McLeod with cats and one is regarding um, ownership of animals and then the other is the um, wandering community cat feral population um, and the TNR program would help mitigate that growing population. So the recommendation tonight that you're making for council is to move forward with the task force, correct? We did have to pause it a little bit because of COVID. The next step was uh, basically a door-to-door -door canvas um, from the task force and volunteers to see what community areas um, require um, some uh, cat care, um, or if they know of where colonies are located, that type of thing. The surveys did help with narrowing that down quite a bit. Um, and I do know that RJ did come down on his own volition the one day and did take a walk through town and looked at some of the areas that he um, heard that night of the community engagement to kind of see and he's recognized a couple of areas himself already. But I think it's more about getting an actual estimated number at this point and um, kind of figuring out the logistics of it. COVID-19 also is um, perhaps um, making them not be able to set up the mobile vet station, um, they would have to be trapped and returned to Calgary, have the service performed there and then brought back to the community um, just because they can't set up a mobile station. He didn't believe that that would be um, an overly large impact to the cost. In fact, it's easier because the stations are already set up and ready to go in Calgary as a permanent location, so it may even uh, reduce the cost slightly. Great. Is anyone prepared to make a motion on this agenda item? I'm prepared to make that motion as for the recommendation. Okay. Further questions for administration? Perhaps I could just ask uh, Ms. Gillingham, do you see any downside of taking this next step? Um, this is really just um, at this point to find out if they're, how big the financial obligation would be and um, they would really be out on the ground looking at these areas specifically to get some really good numbers. Um, the downside would be if we didn't proceed after that, um, the, the time of the task force. Um, there's, uh, mileage is basically the only um, cost at this point that we would be obligated to pay. So it would more just clarify the, our situation, I think. Thank you, and uh, I, I would speak in favor of the motion. I think it's a, a good next step, uh, and I appreciate the work that's been done to know where we're at and, uh, and that this is a, a good next step. Councillor Wolf-Danaglos. I'm definitely interested to see what, um, what they come back with, uh, their research, their survey, or whatever they need to do. Uh, my only concern is um, what are we going to do? What kind of a program or research are we looking are, are we looking into to implement something that is going to prevent this from coming back? Um, cats can multiply rapidly, so this problem could be back in a couple years. Uh, it, it would be an ongoing thing, so I think we have to look back. We have to look into responsible pet ownership as part of the solution, otherwise we're we're not fixing the problem. We're just reacting, in a sense. So that's my only concern. But I'm, I would also be in favor of proceeding with this first step. Do you have any comments on that? Um, mostly, I think the TNR program is a, is a great way to um, help mitigate that population. Um, again, the responsible pet owner, the irresponsible pet owner, I think those are two kind of separate issues from the feral cat and wandering um, cats, wild cats, that type of um, population is what we're trying to capture with this one. 
Um, there does need some um, to be some community education on responsible pet ownership, um, and that's kind of where I think um, we can really put it out there. There's a little bit more research that needs to be done. Um, I did reference Claire's home in here a little bit um, about their, they did a TNR program about seven or eight years ago, and they're just now looking at their population creeping back up and possibly having to do um, another one. But they do also have um, a shelter in their community, and they do use that. Residents can turn animals into it. Um, so we're a little bit different from Clarethome in that sense, that we don't have an animal rescue to be able to utilize on a daily basis if we needed to. So um, that's why I, I feel like we need to do this in two distinct stages. We can't necessarily do um, have a drop-off center for cats because we just don't have that available to us yet, or if ever. Very good. Um, I had a quick question. If there are concerns currently, what avenue do residents take to express their concerns with cats in their neighborhoods? that they're like wandering or um, they can call. Um, I've helped some um, find some resources that they can make deterrence on their own property. Um, and there's a few out there to try and keep other animals off their property. Um, but basically right now it was, the response has kind of been we're, we're waiting just until we can move on with the next step. Um, there isn't a whole lot of mitigation the town can do. Um, it's kind of an individual property owner's responsibility at this, at this time. All right, any other discussion or questions? Councilor Edwards? You said in your uh, recommendation here that the cost might go up because we have to take the cats to Calgary for surgery. I was just wondering if there's any possibility of potentially partnering with our local vet clinics for that day, because I believe it's they do like a one day blitz with all of the surgeries. And I was just wondering if there's a, an opportunity there to potentially utilize some of our own um, businesses in town here rather than having to pay additional mileage to go to Calgary and back. I can definitely um, put that out to RJ to see if he would um, talk to our clinics. I know that the center that they use in Calgary has, um, I believe it's 20 plus available rooms that they do simultaneous. Um, so the time frame for them to do all the surgeries is less. I'm not sure of the exact number, but I can, I can sure ask RJ to reach out to the vets if that's what they look at doing. Very good. Um, if there's no further questions or discussion, we will request um, call it to question. All in favor? Any opposed? Motion carried. All right, moving on then to new business. We have item one, intermunicipal collaboration framework, our emergency services agreement, CAO Sue Keenan. Thank you, Mayor Fader. Um, it's been three long years that Alan and I have been working on the Intermunicipal Collaborative um, Framework Fire or Emergency Services Agreement with our colleagues from around the region. Um, tonight, I am happy to put before Council a recommendation that Council approves the new Intermunicipal Collaborative Emergency Services Agreement between the Town of Fort McLeod and its regional partners, the MD of Willow Creek, Town of Clairesome, Town of Stavely, and the Town of Nanton, as presented. I did not include in your package 70 pages of the schedules. I do have them here, if you'd like me to circulate them. Um, I do also want to go on record, and I did this the other night when we had our regional meeting up in um, at the MD of Willow Creek. Uh, acknowledging the fire chiefs and all of the work and effort and time they put into helping put all of this together and the cooperation and the collaboration it took to compromise on some things. Um, so Alan's been a real trooper. There have been moments um, that we've shook our heads and, you know, didn't think we'd get to the end. So I'm really happy this one's coming before you tonight. <laughs> Yes, kudos to all the staff on working on this. Is anyone prepared to make a motion on this agreement? Councillor Van Hagenbos makes a motion. Um, 
Okay, any further questions for administration? <clears throat> Come on, please, somebody critique it and tear it apart. <laughs> please <Huh>? don't. <laughs> Are, are there any areas of the agreement that you wish to highlight in terms of uh, positive agreement, areas that were problematic in the dispute or in the uh, negotiation? And is there any areas you know that you feel like that you would want to highlight, either yourself or Mr. Zuderman? We want you on camera and on record. Everything you say. Smile. Everything you say. Okay. I have nothing to say. Um. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you do. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Well, um, do I have anything to say? Um, it's been a long road to get to here. Um, any gains, I don't know. Everything's pretty much status quo as far as the town's concerned. There's been some positives and some negatives. I think it's kind of a wash as far as gains or losses for the town per se. So um, as far as service goes, it's not going to affect anything. Yeah. Um, Service-wise and operation-wise, we were always working together. It just never was really written down on paper. Um, and there was, you know, backroom agreements and handshake agreements, and now it's all on paper. So it's, um, yeah, it turned out okay in the end. Councillor Monti. Without being critical, if there's no change, why did it take so long? Um, why did it take so long? I think we started off on the wrong foot and we started going down the wrong path. Um, everybody wanted what they wanted and nobody was working together and then we had a change of administration in the MD and he came up with the idea to gauge everything to the level of service. So from there then it kind of started gaining traction and took off but the first year and a half we had a lot of good lunches, but that was about it. Um, but once Derek come on board and he kind of suggested that we start with a level of service for, for what we do and built off of that, then it, like I say, it gained traction and off we went and got the job done. But the first little while it was, it was painful. I think, too, um, in terms of some of the real positives, um, overall the operations have been streamlined and there are, have been a lot of efficiencies gained. And I'll give you some examples. Um, the economies of, scaling, uh, of scale and buying in bulk has been something that has been agreed upon across the region to save money on uh, fire gear, um, whether it's, what do you call those things? Bunker gear, yeah and you know all the kinds of things that the fire department needs. Um, training has been standardized now across the region, so the requirement is for all of our volunteer firefighters to be trained to the same level um, with the same commitments from each municipality for how that's going to be paid for. Um, there, there's, there's several really good efficiencies, but as Alan said, um, in terms of the day-to-day -day boots on the ground operations, those guys are still doing what they've always done and doing it very well. Most of the efficiencies and the changes have come administratively and base, and definitely reporting function. Just, just one other question for Alan. I know that uh, right from the get-go on this, one of our, our concerns was, was to retain our our independence to be able to act and function the way we choose to. And you're comfortable with that in terms of us being able to call our own shots insofar as our community is concerned? Yeah, like I said before, nothing's, for the town of Fort McLeod, nothing's really going to change. I'm still the fire chief, and it's, um, 
a lot of it was based on what happens when we work together uh, in the community, outside of each community. So um, we're still the Fort McLeod Fire Department and Clarence Holmes, their fire department, and that never really um, was an issue. That's where everybody wanted to be when this was over, and it never really changed from the start. So um, that never really was an issue. Very good. Any other comments, questions? Seeing none, I will uh, call the motion to question. All in favor? Any opposed? Motion carried. Congratulations. <laughs> Stay. And you wanted to add to that? No. no. Okay, good. So we are carrying on then to administrative item number two, and CEO Sukinen is going to introduce this for us. Thank you, Mayor Fader. I've asked Alan to stay because this next one has a significant impact on his department. Um, as Council's aware, um, and I've mentioned it previously, we do have some issues with our fire apparatus crossing over the highway to get to calls um, due to limited uh, visibility. Um, the recommendation before you tonight is that Council approves the expenditure of $23,000 for the purchase and installation of an overhead flashing light system to be located at 3rd Avenue and Highway 3, 25th Street, westbound. Two quotes were obtained. Uh, Public Works will also be doing some work immediately adjacent to the community hall later this spring. Well, now it's summer. Specifically, they will be painting the curbing which runs in front of the hall across the entire property line in red with no parking signage installed to help with that limited visibility. On the west side of the community building, they will be ensuring the curbing is repainted blue, which they do every year for a minimum distance of two car lengths to ensure handicapped parking continues to be available. Um, as I mentioned, the overall issue at this location is the visibility or lack thereof. Um, in other words, visibility is impeded and limited significantly. The cost of our last pumper truck to purchase in 2014 was just shy of $300,000. The cost of our personnel, in my opinion, is priceless. The time is critical now to upgrade this section of the highway so that fire services can safely cross over this two-way. This has been something that's been on Alberta Transportation's board, I think, for 10 years now, and it's never been addressed. And now, of course, Alberta Transportation does not have any financial funding, but they were instrumental in helping us get the second quote. Um, and as you can see, the difference in price is about $25,000. So I thank them for that assistance in steering us in that direction. So I would really encourage and hope that Council would support this recommendation tonight. On this matter, is anyone prepared to make a motion? Councillor Wollstone makes a motion. Okay, any further questions? Councillor Monteith? Are these quotes the same in terms of what they're providing? Yes. Okay, good. Just a question on the uh, how much parking will be lost by the painting of the red uh, line. That is it about five or six spots there. It depends. Um, typically in the summer, it can be one or two Winnebagos because that's where they park to access the fort. Um, in the winter months, I would suggest four or five cars max. Any further discussion or debate? Councillor Van Agabus. Is there something better we can do other than painting the side of the curb? Because, you know, Friday, Saturday night, you have a function there. People park there anyways. And I, they shouldn't, but they do. And there's no enforcement at that time other than if something really happens, then there's obviously the follow-up, but then it's too late. So is there like a some kind of a 
different curb or something we can put there so people just can't park there, period? Because that red paint isn't going to stop anybody from actually parking there, other than the fact that they make the decision not to. Would it be possible then to paint the whole parking area red? I think that might be a little more visible than just the curb. You could bring the curb out so they can't park there. Oakers did and might not like that. Um, so in, in my experience, in a situation like that, your biggest um, item that you can do is just putting up signage and enforcement. Um, the bump outs don't typically work all that well. Um, they're an issue for snow clearing and maintenance on the road. Um, so yeah, you gotta just have enough signs up at the appropriate spacing. Um, Wade and myself have already been at this location and we've staked out what we're gonna do and where we're gonna do it. So that's kind of step one. I've noticed some handicapped parking zones will pick paint the whole parking spot blue. I'm just wondering if that would be an option. We could. Um, the handicap parking on this section is actually on the, just the west side of the building. I think the bigger concern is actually on mm. the so west. So paint it red instead of blue. Oh, that's Yeah, that's what we're intending to do. The whole thing. Correct, for the whole width of the, of the building. Just the curb. Oh. A little more costly, but I mean, it's more visible. Yeah, that's the most you can get. Yeah. So the fact of the matter is red's not your t standard color. So in the manual for manual of uniform traffic control, the devices of from the TAC Association. That's kind of what governs what we can do on on the pavement and signage. Um, red's sort of atypical. Uh, we can get it. It should only go on the curb. Um, yeah, I, I don't think we would do it on the pavement. I don't think they would approve it either. Okay. Um, Councilor Manangos. Would it be a tow zone? Because that usually works quite well if, if that's communicated. We could do that signage. Um, in, inherently from having the no parking signs up, that's, that's always an option as long as they're tagged, so. Very good. Any further discussion or questions? Everyone's clear on the motion. Call with the question, all in favor? Any opposed? Motion carried. Thank you very much. I think you're free to go. Unless you want to join us, Alan. Check, it seems like you're really check enjoying with yourself. Sue first. <laughs> Thank you all. Um, if you had a couple minutes, you can come out and see the new purchase. I brought it tonight. If you'd like to come and have a look, or if that works, the new bush buggy's here, so you can see where you're tax dollars went I think if you we want to take a minute take a recess five minute recess is council good with that yes. all right let's do it
Did you arrange that, Sue? Did you arrange that? That was nice. Oh, good. That was very nice. Thank you. All right. So we will uh, read, uh, reconvene. Um, item number three under new business financial services. Before we get started on these, I was wondering if there's any way that these can be put into one form or does it always have to be individual? For the, the tax variance requests, it has to be, yeah. Individual, please. Okay. All right, so we have up uh, number one, Director of Finance, Chris Holbeck. Good evening, Council. Uh, annually, I bring you our uh, tax waiver requests. I got them all at the same time this year, so they're all on the same agenda. We will begin with the Greaseback 2020 property tax variance request. Um, there's been no change um, to the parameters of this request since last year. Um, the Griesbach property uh, is on the one way. It uh, was um, rezoned commercial back in the 80s when a land use bylaw was amended. And since then, um, the Griesbachs came to council, requested that they are uh, taxed as per residential and not commercial and councils have fulfilled their request. So every year the Griesbach property comes before us. Uh, and the current year's financial tax waiver would be $325.62. A motion from council. Councillor Monteith. Any further discussion? Questions? Councillor Edwards. Sorry, I do have a question. Is there a reason why we don't just rezone the land so that it's residential, so we don't have to do this every year? I'm not the development officer, <laughs> but my thoughts would be um, the entire one ways are all, have all been rezoned commercial. And as those residential, they either have to use them res commercially or as they um, get demolished, that you have to build a commercial pro building and they have to be used commercially. So this is just one of those one-offs. Very well. Um, so motion is on the floor. Any further discussion? Call the question on favor. Any opposed? Motion carried. Thank you. Moving on to item four, another tax variance request by the Stanky family. Uh, so this is the second of our tax, uh, property tax variance requests. Um, the Stankies were part of uh, an annexation by the town uh, where the town took, um, took them into the, Fort the town of Fort McLeod's municipal boundaries. At the time they requested, as part of the annexation order actually, um, it was promised that for the next five years after the annexation they would be taxed as if they were still in the MD of Willow Creek. So for those five years, that's what we did. Um, after that time, they came to council and requested the same treatment for this property until the, the property owner passes away. Uh, Mr. Stinky is still alive and annually we get this request. Thank you. Is anyone prepared to make a motion on this? Councilman Agmos makes a motion. Any further discussion or questions? Call the question on favor. Any opposed? Motion carried. Moving on then to item five, Alberta Lodge 2020 property tax variance request. Director of Finance, Chris Holbeck. Uh, thank you, Mayor Fader. Uh, the final property tax variance request is one we get every year also from the Masons. Uh, they own a property that is also on the one way. They um, are also in the same, I guess, predicament that uh, the Griesbeck property is in. It was residentially zoned uh, and then it was rezoned to commercial and they request annually that we tax them as if they were residential property owners and used it residentially. 
and the tax variance this year for this one is 887.75, and last year it was 953.30. All right, thank you. Is anyone prepared to make a motion on this agenda item? Councillor Edwards makes a motion. Any further questions or discussion? Seeing none, we'll call the question on favor. Any opposed? Motion carried. All right, we'll move on to item six, operational matter regarding the Wilderness Park Gates. Uh, Director of Operation, Adrian Pedro. Thank you, Council. Um, this first submission is to bring to council's attention and to accept as information that um, administration took it upon ourselves to close the wilderness park gain access to vehicles. Um, this happened at the beginning of the COVID situation, just preemptively anticipating higher pedestrian volumes in that area. And due to the poor alignment and poor visibility and lack of signage along that particular trail, uh, we felt that this was a necessity. Um, since we've closed that, we've seen a much higher use of that trail by pedestrian traffic there. So our intent is to keep that that gate on the west side of Highway 811 closed permanently and to have just a few parties have a key to that gate. So I'm just asking that council reviews and accepts this as information. Any discussion or questions from Council? Councillor Edwards? I have some uh, community members who are going to be ecstatic to hear this because I got stopped in the post office more than once on this particular topic and they love that it's been closed off since COVID started and they were petitioning me to make sure that that remained after the situation changed. So I know that there'll be lots of community members who are appreciative and um, We've seen a lot more animal activity down there since there's no vehicles and all sorts of things. So it's great and I applaud you for taking the initiative to continue keeping that road uh, restricted so that we don't have as much vehicle traffic. Councillor. On the other hand, um, just being down there just a couple days ago, there's obviously uh, at least some who are not happy with this uh, given that it's clear that someone's driven into that gate and almost push through it with their vehicle. Um, in terms of a safety issue, I, I, I would uh, question just how much of a safety issue there is. Uh, I don't know that we've had any near misses along that line before or on that uh, road before. Um, having spent a lot of time in the park and vehicles that do go down there in the past years, uh, I know there are those who will not walk to the end of that because it's so far and yet they do enjoy going down to the end of that and, <clears throat> and enjoying that end of the park. So in some ways, this is restricting the use of that park for many citizens. And uh, for those who drive down that road and sit at the end of that road and, and enjoy the park from that perspective, uh, that, that is uh, being taken away from them. So on the one hand, there will be citizens who are happy with that um, but undoubtedly there will be a number uh, who will not be pleased with that. Um, clearly there was uh, much use of that road in the past. It's not like it grew over with weeds. There were lots of people that drove down there. Now if the other rationale is that we want to better control what was happening when people drove down there, that's, that's not in your rationale here. Um, but uh, I, I, I just have a question whether it's, it's uh, overstepping. Um, and, and, and actually taking away from the use of the park as opposed to uh, freeing up the use. But it's not council's decision, it's information, but those are some, some concerns that I have with that uh, move. Councilman Agnes? I would second those concerns. Councilor Wilson? Yes, uh, I don't know how many used to play slow pitch down there, but that used to be slow pitch diamonds. And it was used to be extremely busy road. And I don't remember really have, ever having any accidents, but you guys, you played slow pitch there at least twice a week. And, uh, you know, there'd be four or five teams down there. And uh, it seemed to work well. So I can see the point, but I, I'm not sure how safe, how much safety comes involved in here. 
On this matter, I'm personally a little mixed. Some ways nice to restrict it. On the other hand, the traffic uh, accessing the entire park and for some that have some inability to walk those kind of distances, I think being able to drive, but I understand vandalism as well. So I'm a bit mixed, but feedback from community would administration appreciate? Or is this a final decision indefinitely? Or how, how is this to be looked at? Uh, no, we're, we're open to feedback. Um, throughout the entire process since we first closed it, we only heard from one particular resident on multiple occasions. We mm -hmm. hadn't heard from anyone else. Okay. Just a comment on that. Residents <laughs> recognizing that the park needed to be closed because of COVID concerns is a very different issue than it being closed because we just don't want traffic on that anymore. I, I can see why residents wouldn't raise a complaint if it's been closed for COVID reasons. Uh, they're not going to complain in that situation. Uh, would be my interpretation of that uh, minimal feedback to this point. <laughs> right, so I appreciate the commentary. Um, I think fact of the matter is though that trail um, certainly by engineering standards is not suitable for more than one vehicle down there. It's not suitable to accommodate pedestrian traffic and vehicles at the same time. Um, the whole rationale to keep the west side closed is that that's because it, that's the bigger issue. We are trying to accommodate people who are trying to get into that area by keeping the gate on the east side open. Right. Well, I think as long as people know that we're open to feedback, this doesn't have to be permanent. And this is something we want to analyze. Um, I've had one individual comment on it that they've always liked the opportunity to drive and whether they're walking their dogs down in the bottom or not sure what um but either way uh yeah any further comments councillor Monteith? i'm a little confused because i don't use the wilderness park so are we limiting access to the girl guide camp with this so we're not locking a gate to the girl guide camp no, okay, good, because that was a concern that was raised to me, so I'm happy. And that's strictly the west side, not the east side of the highway. Okay, so um, motion to accept as information. Councillor Edwards makes that motion. Yeah, and I, I'd encourage council, if you're getting feedback from residents, to make sure um, that feedback's directed to um, Director of Operations, I assume. Yeah, that's correct. I mean, if we hear overwhelming feedback that this is actually a concern, then we can certainly reconsider. And a quick question, the, the, the other individuals that would have a key, is there any risk of that being abused? Because they have a key and no one else does? No, the only private um, landowner that would have a key is one down by the end. Um, and that's the only way to access his property. Right. So other than that, they're just members of the okay. town. And I think there's clear indicators that people, if they have any concerns with the park itself, they can call the town office, correct? Correct, yeah. Okay. All right. So if there's no other comments or discussion, the motion's on the floor. We'll call with question all in favor. Any opposed? Motion carried. Um, moving on then to item seven, operations, arena wall mural repairs, director of operations, Adrian Pedro. Thank you, Mayor Pedro. So this submission has come up because we did enlist an artist to do some paint repairs on the arena mural. Um, in the process of doing those repairs, she discovered that the varnish on basically the in a large part of the mural is is depleted. Um, we suspect that this is one of the big reasons that the mural is starting to bubble and peel off. So tonight we're asking for council to approve approximately $9,000 worth of funding to redo the varnish on that mural. All right, thank you very much. Is there a 
A motion from Council on this item. Councilor Monkeys. All right. Any um, comments? Councilor Monkeys. Are we only talking about varnish or are we pairing the mural and then putting the varnish on? So we've already contracted the artist to do the repairs out of our current operating budget. This is just for that additional amount for the varnish. All right, any other questions or discussion? What's the expected life of this renewed varnish? Do we have a time, kind of a, an approximate time frame? Obviously it's needed to be redone now, so I'm just looking forward, are we? Yeah, we, we did pose that question to the, the person doing it. It was hard for her to, to say, because it really depends on what type of elements it gets exposed to. She was estim estimating anywhere between at least five to 10 years. So it wasn't a, a very specific range, unfortunately. Either way, if no varnish is put on, the work that she's currently doing is probably very minimal benefits as well. Right, and on the same token, more of the mural is gonna deteriorate, so. So if we're not properly maintaining right. ongoingly. Right. It's unfortunately that's that's the downfall of using paint right. outside. <laughs> it, it does wear away, it does peel, so right. this is just part of that maintenance. Okay, very good. Uh, Councillor Wilson. If we're gonna have a mural, we need to keep it up looking good because nothing works looks worse than some tacky thing. Correct. All right. Any other discussion? A motion is on the floor. We'll call it the question. All in favor? Any opposed? Motion carried. All right. We are on to operations. Offsite levy bylaw study and updates. Director of operations, Adrian Pedro. Thank you, Council. Um, so this submission is for Council to approve the expenditure of $29,000 for MPE to complete the formal review and update of the town's offsite levy bylaw. Um, a little bit of background on this. Our current bylaw, as many of you know, is just applicable to the east side of town, just on the east side of Highway 2. Originally put in place, as far as I understand, as part of the police college grounds. That offsite levy bylaw is inapplicable to this date and doesn't apply to the entire town. Um, the intent here is to have something that would be applicable to the entire town and the benefit of that process is that MP would also look at all the developable areas in town and that would sort of help any future consideration for upsizing of infrastructure or any offsite infrastructure that may be needed for development. So has twofold, one, to be a revenue generator and to help cover costs of infrastructure, so. This is not a small ticket item. Um, how does council wanna go? Is someone prepared to make a motion on this and then we can have some discussion and debate? Councilor Montes. As per the recommendation. Okay, so motions on the floor regarding offsite levy bylaw study and updates. Is there any discussion from council? I have a few questions in regarding the, the amount of funds, or perhaps maybe first you can give us a general idea how an engineering firm would actually make that final recommendation to us. What are they actually doing to get us to that point? So they would work together with um, the town, with ORSC, just to look at all the available land. Um, so all the available land, what's currently developed, what could be developed, um, and they would look at different race structures for what infrastructure we may, we may need going forward based on what gets developed. And then they would develop a formula that would be applied to each new development. 
Um, and as part of that process, it, it's quite labor intensive, um, hence why it's not a small chunk of, of a dollar figure. Um, at the end, we would have a bylaw that would apply to the whole town. So that would all fall within their scope of work. And the other part of that is to, those rates would be compared to other jurisdictions to see how competitive we are for that. Because of course we don't want to put the offsite bylaw rates too high or else that discourages development. Are you aware of what other communities are sized to for offsite levies? I'm, I'm concerned that we can go down this road, but if every other municipality in our region does not have anything like an offsite levy bylaw, is what, what would that do to us so we can do the study, but in the end, we still have to be prepared to implement. If we're not prepared to implement, then it's not a very, not worth going that far down the road. Agreed. So that that's the fine balancing act, right? So that's the exercise we're going to have to go through when we compare rates to other jurisdictions um, and see what's what's enough and what's a fine balance where we're going to still attract that investment. Um, I think if council essentially has two options, we can repeal the old one and not have any in the town. But as far as I'm concerned, that's a bit of a wasted opportunity to recover some of those costs. Because if you don't do that, then the town's on the hook for doing any sort of infrastructure upgrades that we need to, to accommodate that development. And that sort of applies to not just the underground, but that could apply to kind of like I say in my background, libraries, fire halls, anything like that. So it's a pretty broad scope of what the, the amount would cover. So, two options you can go. You can have something that's competitive, that still that is able to attract people because they can see the benefit of that, or we can get rid of it completely. So in principle, would the idea be to reduce tax burden if you have an offsite levy because the offsite levy is intended to pay for a lot of the infrastructure that we would normally would out of general revenue? Correct. We just don't know how much that would be. Right. We don't know at this point, so that's why we need to go through the study to see how much that rate would be. And it would all be based on per hectare of new development, so. And timeline for completion? I didn't see that in there when I looked through it, but. Yeah, we, we kind of left it open-ended. Um, if we did get approval to do it, we were thinking end of the year. So get something in place for 2021. How do you mean open-ended? In terms of the, the completion date for it. But it, for, would have a, study. it would have a final, a finished final timeline. Right. Yeah, for the bylaw to be in place for 2021. Right. <clears throat> Any other questions from any council? Um, yeah, I have just, <clears throat> so I reviewed the, uh, the documentation that you've provided and, uh, and I'm trying to just get clear in my mind at the end of the day what that will, Um, what purpose that will serve in, in our decision making? Does it boil down to us determining the amount of what a levy would be depending upon the work that is being done? Is that is that the, the bottom line uh, or what, at least one of the bottom lines as to how this is to serve us and that it will provide us with um, a framework to determine what a levy would be on a particular infrastructure project? Correct, yeah. So as part of this exercise is determining those rates. Um, and of course, those rates could be adjusted by council in the bylaw, should you choose to do so. The rates that would be recommended um, would be sort of current. That's why going forward a bylaw like this, the rates need to be reviewed every few years. 
but yes, it is part of that, that exercise. And if I may, I know offsite levies can be controversial, especially in cities, because uh, an individual will buy a lot to build a house on, and then later they find out there's an offsite levy on that lot when they want to build. If I'm understanding that correct. So I'm just wondering at some point council needs to also determine do we want to even consider residential properties in this discussion or not because if all of a sudden on our new lots that we have for sale there's now all of a sudden an offsite levy that gets tacked onto them than never did before. So I think when when would council have that discussion to make sure we're not presenting ourselves in a position that does not shed good light on what we want to do. And that would come like during the bylaw stage. So once the study is completed, then we actually know what kind of areas that we're dealing with, what the proposed rates are, then we can certainly look at exclusions. At that time, council would also determine what percentage the offsite levy is will cover for the costs of upgrades. 100% or 50%? Um, it, it typically it would be based like it's a dollar value per hectare, so. But in order to set that dollar amount, yeah. you would have to determine how much of the development costs you want to cover with that amount of money, correct? Right. right. Yeah, it, this is an unknown for a lot of us. So. Councillor Monti. I've just been, uh, I just Googled offsite levies and many come up and they're all bigger centers. So I'm just wondering, are, do smaller centers have this or is it just bigger centers? Typically it's, I don't want to say it's typically larger centers, but yes, predominantly it's the larger centers that have it. Um, I find that there's, just there isn't an appetite or there's a lack of understanding for smaller jurisdictions because they're afraid to deter development. Um, and from my perspective, I think that's a bit of a fallacy because there is some room there to play with the rates. So you may not go for the same rates that a large city might, but as per the MGA, we do have this in our ability to be charged on land development. So it's a, again, it's a bit of a fine line how far we take it. Um, so the, to the best of your knowledge, there's not a lot of small communities or size that would have an offsite levy, would you know? That's correct. Um, I, I know there's, I don't want, want to mix up my names here. It's either Colehurst or Coaldale that has one. I think it's Coaldale. So Clarisome has one, but they they just have a new industrial park, and they've only applied the offsite levy to that park. Um, Nanton has one. Uh, Sparwood, Pitcher Creek, they stopped implementing them. Crow's Nest Pass, they stopped implementing them when the population rates started to, and the development rates started to drop. So. Councillor Van I can see the benefit this has for larger centers where it's, you have to be, um, everything has to be fair and even across the board, whether it's the north, south, east, west. Um, but where we deal with such minimal amount of, I guess there's development and then there's projects, but to set a bylaw in place that has some key multipliers in a sense or rates and apply that to things that are so unknown, you know, project costs, things like that. I, I just have a little bit of issue. Like I think we're better served with, you know, the offsite level we had on the police lands based on, did we have an offsite level on that? Based on that specific because of that cost, I think we're better served by 
one-offs like if we do an industrial area and we implement that so I don't know if that's needed if the, any, any of this is needed to implement that but I just think a, a huge document that goes down to libraries pools things like that I I'm, I'm having a bit of difficulty grasping how that implies how that applies to a small town like one cloud do you have a response on that right? I think that's that's a a fair comment. Um, I think what you'll wind up happening in that case is that the town will be on the hook for any sort of upgrades. Um, I'll bring up the A Street line that was uh, installed. Um, let's say, for example, the town decides to upgrade further west in the southwest industrial area. If we choose to say put more density in that location, I'm just using this as an example, I'm not saying we're gonna do it, um, then obviously that would require that that line be upgraded or a new line be put in. Um, so in, in that situation, if there was no offsite levy, essentially the town would be on the hook for, for fitting the bill for that. Um, whereas if there was an offsite levy, that cost would be subsidized at least partially by that development. So. We can certainly look at different areas, but I think it's important to do the, the exercise for the whole town. And then once we have that analysis, we can actually pick and choose which areas that we wanna implement this. I think it's a lot harder to pick areas and then not know when development is gonna go in there. So to have that timing line up for that offsite levy bylaw for that particular area with that development, I think would be difficult. So at least if we do the exercise for the whole town, then we have that information prior. Very good, Councillor Wilson. Well, I, I don't, if we're not gonna use this offsite levy, it's silly to spend money to develop, spend 29,000 to me. So we gotta, first of all, make sure that we're gonna use it before we spend the money on it, I believe. Councillor Monteith. So my question would be, is this a good investment for us to make the right decision at the end of the time, whether we put it into place or we don't put it into place? Um, the simple answer is yes. So I'll, I'll take the 8th Street example again. So had we done this study and this assessment prior to that project going on, we would have actually known what the potential developable area was. So we could have increased that size of that line appropriately at that time. So it, you do have some power in the information that we're gonna get out of this. So. <clears throat> I appreciate that comment for sure. I'm curious how this would tie into asset management. Is there any way to piggyback the two a little bit because they are doing a lot of the same research in terms of capacity? of the infra infrastructure? It would help tie in. Um, it's not gonna, it's not gonna get us really far down the asset management line though. Councilor Edwards. I'm just wondering how, how critical this item is at this moment. Like is this something we need to push forward with right now for a specific reason? Or is it something that we can look at in the fall when we have a chance to have a committee of the whole meeting where we can really understand what it is you're asking us for? Is that like is that unreasonable, or do, is there a timeline that you're trying to meet, or something that we're unaware of? No, it's pretty open. Uh, the whole reason this came up was because of the sale of the um, 135 acres, and we had that offsite levy in place for that location, but we started looking at that and we determined that that wasn't a viable offsite levy to charge for that parcel because um, it was outdated. It didn't apply to that particular development. So that's the whole reason why I come up. Should council decide to defer this, then we can certainly do so. I'm just curious because of the expense, if it's worth saying yes to an expense, like we're, we don't even know if we want to go down this road. So that's, I think that saying yes to something that we're not 100% sure we're gonna use is 
is a little bit difficult. I don't know. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, and I don't like. That's why I'm asking. Is it like? Is it critical to do the study? Can we at least talk about what this all is and what it entails in a broader, you know, a more detailed conversation versus here in this meeting at this moment? Um, or is it? Is is a me another meeting gonna just muddy the waters more, and we might as well just carry on? Councillor. So, did you want to respond, Adrian? Yeah, um, if we are going to defer this to another meeting, I would suggest that maybe council provides a list of questions that they want um, want answered at that time. Councilor, uh, we have had some some considerable conversation over the last number of months about uh, developing an offsite levy bylaw, and I have voiced my support in having such a bylaw. Uh, I think that the MJ provides us with that opportunity to be able to uh, more directly uh, place the costs of certain infrastructures on those who are benefiting disproportionately uh, from that expenditure. And so I am in support of the idea of having a, an offsite levy bylaw. This particular uh, study or, or report that's being um, sought as I look through the details on that, I too have a similar concern that that this um, fits more with a larger community and a larger situation than the the uh, in a sense one-off situations that we will be looking at for a, where we would actually apply a, an offsite levy bylaw. We will be having discussions in those particular situations, whether it's this street or that street development, as to what proportion we are going to put into or ask what kind of levy we would put on that particular project. And I don't, uh, I'm not seeing the connection, although you do make the one point about uh, in a certain development that we would have had greater capacity if we'd had this information. But I, I, uh, I, my concern is that we're going to get a lot of information from this kind of a study that we will use only a very small portion of that information in our actual decision making when we look to apply an offsite levy bylaw. And so I would look more at the offsite levy bylaw, get that in place so that we have that flexibility to uh, put a levy in place. And at that point, look at that specific situation and look at consistency across, I believe that's some of the conversation that we've had before, whether it's uh, redoing a particular street or whether it's just paving or whether it's uh, roads on the uh, southwest side. It's like we have individual projects, a very small grouping of things where there would be an offsite levy that would apply. So it just seems to me like like the scope of this particular report seems to be much bigger than what we will actually use. Although again, I come back, I am in favor of having an offsite levy bylaw. Adrian, go ahead. So if I'm understanding correctly, I think there's a bit of a confusion between the local improvement tax and the offsite levy bylaw. Um, the local improvement tax, I think, speaks to what a lot of what you were referring to there. Okay. Um, the offsite levy bylaw um, looks at development and as a whole and what our future needs are, as opposed to the particular section we're replacing at that time, and how. Where yeah, the local improvement tax would be applicable to those adjacent landowners for that particular development. The offsite levy bylaw would look in an area and would assess the impact that that area is going to have on infrastructure in the town as a whole, as opposed to a localized section. Thank you for that clarification. Hopefully, I sit corrected. That makes sense. Yep. With that being said, how many whole sections do we have that are up for development in the next 10 years? Um, that I, I hope more than we think we, we have, but um, currently one in a sense. So I'm wondering how this document will support 
all developments, residential, commercial, industrial, all, all the all the zoning we currently have and, and the effects that has on current infrastructure. Um, couldn't we break this down a bit more to our sp specific needs instead of having a, a document that is heavy and that is worded to reflect what we want today, but when it actually needs to be implemented, isn't won't, won't reflect what we want to do then or, or be realistic based on the, the constant economic changes in a, in a small town. Like I just feel that this, this document, yeah, I don't know, might not have as much merit as we'd want it to be, want it to have. And did you want any feedback on that? Because I think uh, I think there's some valid points that have been made. Uh, I we want we hesitate doubling up on taxes too. Obviously, you have a local improvement tax, and then you have an offsite levy. Because I think even new developments are going to be subject to offsite levy or uh, local improvement taxes. And at the same time as. Um, uh, Offsite levies, so that's a little concerning. Um, I was wondering, is MPE in a position where they might um, be able to shrink it? Like, do we need them to be looking at public facilities like libraries, fire halls, police stations for a town of size when that might be 30 years down the road that that might be triggered? And 30 years down the road, all the numbers that we use to calculate costs would probably be irrelevant. In terms of the the values attributed to per hectare, that always gets reassessed. I think there's there's merit to looking at all potential development. Um, let's use McLeod Meadows as an example. Um, of course, that's not for you know very future development. It's long term. Um, but should a development like that happen, there's going to be certain needs put on the town for that, whether aside from the underground infrastructure and the roads. So there, there may be a need to put a bigger library or additional recreation facility. So I would hesitate to remove anything from the scope because I think that gets more towards looking at isolated areas. And to me, that's not that that's a, not a worthy endeavor to go down because I think that's a bit of a waste of time and resources at that time. I look at the first three items that they're looking at, and they're looking at how all our infrastructure is going to tie together as we look at different areas that we may develop. And it seems to me that that information will help us over the next 20 years or so, so that we don't do a piecemeal uh, additions to our system, but we do it logically and they all tie in together. So if that if this report does that, I think it's well worth the money because then we're not going to be doing this and then find out we should be doing this because this suddenly happens. But if they're going to look at the total town and where we've talked about, um, you know, on the east end of town or south end of town or whatever, and it ties in what we're going to have to do for storm water, for water, for sewer, whatever. That's a valuable document that we can use for the next 20, 30 years. So if that's what it's going to do, I'm all for it. Yeah, that, that's correct. That's the intent. So that's exactly what it will do. That's certainly part of, a large part of what it'll do. Um, whether council choose at that time, once the bylaws in front of them to implement it or not, mm. that's a different story. Right now. So your voice and your support comes from Monty. Any other comments, debates? I'm just worried it's a thirty thousand dollar document that's gonna sit on the shelf. That that's my concern and I hope you know, I hope I'm wrong. 
Well, I, for the large part, I echo Councillor Monti's sentiments because uh, with the amount of volume of land we have, it's critical that we're planning for the development of those lands. Otherwise, we end up in a position where we can't develop on those lands. So um, for that reason, I would support um, this initiative. Just a question on that. Um, obviously, we don't have this report now, and we're making decisions. Councils have been making decisions on development. And um, what have we been relying on at that point? Making an assessment on that one project and then going from there and then finding out later that we miscalculated on what our needs are. So I'm just trying to compare the decision making that you know we're making now or in the past few years with respect and how this report is going to uh, uh, prevent missteps in the future. I think I'm gaining a better understanding of what it's intended to do. That's a good and perfectly valid question. Um, so, so typically, let's take the Southwest Industrial. Um, what typically engineering would look at is your your current area. Um, they would forecast to a point what the future needs of that area are. Um, but largely what, what governs new design is, is the latest standard. So essentially what's taking that, that infrastructure and upsizing it is just the most re revised requirements of any standards we're following. So whether it's AT, CSA, whatever, um, whatever standards we're dealing with at the time, um, this, this study will certainly help navigate any sort of future projects we do. Um, I can't say that it's gonna 100% eliminate all mistakes because that's not possible, but it's certainly gonna help. If we had this report prior to A Street being done, then I think we would be having a different discussion of the size of infrastructure that was there. All right, very good discussion. Thanks, everyone. Is there any closing comments? Questions? CEO Keenan, did you have anything to add? No. All right. Anything that you would change in your recommendation based on our discussion, the Director of Operations? No, nothing. Okay. Um, the motion is on the floor. If there's no further debate or discussion, Motion is to approve as per the recommendation. I'll call it the question, all in favor? Any opposed? Motion carried. Thank you. All right, moving on then to operations. We have a proposal from EPCOR, Director of Operations, Adrian Pedro. Thank you, Council. Um, so this submission is um, <clears throat> asking council to approve $27,000 worth in expenditures to review the uh, wastewater and waste and sorry water and wastewater plants um, what EPCOR provided provided three different areas to look at we're asking that only two of the areas be done at this time because we feel that the first area is unnecessary given the, the age of our infrastructure so the two that we've selected to do is the operations efficiency assessment and the rates comparison and commercial options, uh, plus some general expenses, which equals $27,000. Uh, this one I think is pretty critical at this time because um, we are, as you guys are aware, we're currently looking at some cost reduction methods and some efficiencies if possible. Um, EPCOR is a, a good resource. They have a lot of experience in this industry, so I think their unbiased opinion and assessment of our department would be worthwhile. I must say from the start, you must be feeling pretty confident to have two similar proposals on the same night or on the same price. <laughs> um, it's a, it'll be a good discussion. I, I would like to see a, a, a motion from council as per the recommendation, and we can have some discussion and debate regarding this matter as well. Councillor Edwards makes a motion to approve. 
All right. Um, questions for administration? Let's start with that. Councillor Orr. Um, if I recall correctly, and that's an assumption, uh, there have been some some discussion about the, the potential inefficient inefficiencies that exist and and um, and this is looking for an external confirmation of that can you is that true can you give us some sense for um, what kind of efficiencies we this this may reveal or bring forward obviously if you knew all the inefficiencies we wouldn't have to pay for them but uh, but can you give us a sense for what we're looking at? The, the first one that comes to mind is, is staffing levels. So with the equipment and the technology that we have in, in the plants, um, we do have our doubts in terms of what staffing levels are needed. So we currently operate at a full-time capacity with three operators. Um, whether we need to continue doing that or not is yet to be seen. So we're looking for some external information on that. So that's just one area that we see obvious efficiencies. There could be a whole plethora of them. Councillor This initiative has my full support. Um, just a quick uh, question slash comment. Do you, do you see need or room for initiatives like this in other areas of our um, operations? For the external, other external departments, um, I wouldn't see as big of a need for them. Um, there might be minor tweaks here or there, that, but we can certainly handle those internally. The, the wastewater and the water plant operations is a much bigger scale, and EPCOR has much better expertise than we do. I have uh, two questions. Um, First one is, will they be looking, because obviously we're not fully aware of technology and resources that might be available to improve efficiencies. Is that something they will be highlighting? Yeah, they'll be looking at everything. Is that something, and I'm just curious, why do we need a consultant to tell us about these improvements? Well, we don't have that expertise or that, that background to, to provide us with that those recommendations, so our staff wouldn't, or correct. Our current staff, they do, they do provide certain recommendations and they're, they're small things that we implement. Um, I think at, at times there are some reservations from staff to make certain changes. So I think this gives us the backing to say, okay, we've had an external review these, this is what they're recommending. And so it gives us a little bit more footing to implement any changes that are necessary. Any uh, guesses at what cost savings we might be able to recover if we implement the findings of this report? Like what's the return on investment? No idea. <laughs> okay. We may generate more revenue because they're looking at our rates too. Correct. Yeah, so there, there's a lot of different aspects being looked at. Okay. Um, any further discussion, debate? Seeing none, I um, will call it the question. All in favor? Any opposed? Motion carried. Um, carrying on then to. Southwest Industrial Geotechnical Report, which I believe is strictly for information. Director of Operations, Stephen Pedro. That is correct. So this is the final report for the Southwest Industrial Area Geotechnical Study that was completed. Um, certainly some interesting findings. Um, nothing that surprised us too much, but it did confirm that we can develop in that area. Um, and it did provide some guidelines in terms of backfilling and the material type that we should use in that area. So I think it's certainly an important document to include in our tender for phase one. Okay. Um, anyone have any questions on this report? 
copying its information. It's just there for your. Do you understand it? <laughs> and because I think we undertook this report mostly regarding phase one of the infrastructure development, correct? Just to make sure that the water was not going to negatively impact the operations. Not as much focused on further develop development west of the current industrial park. It looked, it was twofold. Okay. So it looked at the existing area and then it did partially look at that area to the west. So this is, this is something that would be on file, and then any does anyone in that area have access to it? Um, like if there's a new building going up on an existing lot, would they be able to make use of it? For sure. Yeah. Yeah. yeah same like just, we've done with other land, town owned land. We've provided them with geotechnical reports. So it could reports. go on the town's website. Uh, no, they likely have to request it from myself. Okay. So as long as we know that they can request it if they are in need. Very good. Um, so motion to accept this information. Councillor Orr makes a motion. There is no further discussion. We'll call the question all in favor. Any opposed? Motion carried. And I believe that concludes the public portion of our meeting. We have one land item to go in camera for, so I will request a motion from Council to go in camera for one land item. Councillor Edwards makes a motion. All in favor? Any opposed? Motion carried.